Well, good morning. Here we are Wednesday. I think a lot of you, from what I understand, are waiting for the debates tonight. Uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Nevada, however they want to pronounce it. Uh, I plan to watch it, but I want to tell you, and I've been telling you, I don't think that the outcome of this election is going to affect the direction of this country. It will alter it one way or another, but ultimately the hope for our country is not in this election. Now, I will watch the debate tonight, and I plan to vote, but I want you to understand what I've been trying to tell you and what I've been trying to uh, to get the church to do is the only hope for this country, and that is that we that we have got to come out of Babylon and turn back to the Father. The election is not going to turn our future. As I've said from the beginning when I started this, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, that every, all churches like to quote, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven. He will heal their land and forgive their sins. And I'm going to tell you, nobody, as I said, ever reads the next eight verses in that chapter where God tells us it's turning back and keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes. And you can, you can post that on the marquee out in front of your church, verse 14, all you want to. My friend, you'll stay a dead church. It's not going to change our country. It's not going to change our city until we, until we refuse the mark of the beast and turn back to keeping God's commandments. I know when I said yesterday that the church has already accepted the mark of the beast, that probably shocks a lot of them. You say, my goodness, how could you say such a thing? Well, I want you to, I want you to open your mind and just think with me a little bit. The whole, we've got to look at the book of Revelation and look at God's word uh, from a new perspective, not from the Christian teaching that we've been given for the last 1,800 years or so, but just take God's word uh, at face value. We saw that John, in Revelation in chapter 1, verse 9, he said, I, John, who also, that is, I'm with you, I also am your brother and companion in tribulation. So John is saying that he was already in the tribulation. It's not going to start 2,000 years down the road, like uh, the replacement theologians and all have told us. John said he was our, his, your brother, and companion, that is, I'm in this with you, in this tribulation. And so the, where the church is really messed up is in thinking that the, the tribulation was going to be a seven-year period that would come at the end of the church age or after the church is taken out, and that is just nowhere taught in Scripture. But if we'll just take John at his word and understand that he is in tribulation, and why is he in tribulation? He, he is, he, why is he exiled to the Isle of Patmos? It is because of the word of God, that is, Torah, Tanakh. The only, only word of God they had at that time was the book we call the Old Testament that we all ignore, except when a preacher needs to go and preach tithing, then we'll go and pick a verse out of that to get you 10% from you, which is an abomination in itself. Uh, but that's, that's a different message for a different time. Uh, but... Uh, We've got to understand the tribulation started 2,000 years ago. And so when I say that the church has already accepted the mark of the beast, that is, we have believed the lie of Satan. That is the mark of the beast. And I hope that some of you uh, did what I suggested you do yesterday, that you go and Google the frontal lobe of the brain, because he caused them to receive a mark in their forehead. He didn't, he didn't tattoo them in their forehead. He caused them to receive, uh, to accept. And we find later in Revelation that this is the beast that deceived the whole world. In other words, it is deception. And it is the lie that he has convinced us to accept. And so we've been, we've been taught that we don't have to keep our Father's commandments. And uh, that is the mark of the beast. Sunday worship, instead of observing the Sabbath, is the mark of the beast. But the good news to you out there is that, that you can be part of the revival, going to your congregation, going to your denomination, to your pastor, uh, whatever your position is, and being part of the, the revival that God is trying to spark in, this, in, in the country and in the, indeed in the world, as you say, why don't we just give God the benefit of the doubt and go back and begin to keep his Sabbath and keep his dietary laws and, and see if maybe, if just maybe, that might make a difference because what we're doing certainly is not working. Anybody that looks at this country and, 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 and anybody that wants to look at the presidential candidates we've got and the kind of dialogue that they're having, it makes anybody want to vomit that we're part of this country. 
But the problem is not politicians. The problem is the church. The problem is that the church has believed the lie of Satan, and we have no power, and consequently, uh, the only hope is turning back to God. And I realize, I realize that you're going to shake things up. Uh, if, if we went from Sunday to observing the Sabbath and keeping the dietary laws, my God, what are they going to do about the mud bug festival here in Shreveport? Oh, my goodness, that's a big economic deal. It brings, that brings in a whole lot of money. In fact, most of Louisiana's uh, economy, as far as food is concerned, is based upon eating uh, filth and things that God said were not food. So it's really going to be a it's really going to be a a change to the country if we were to turn back to obeying our father's commandments. But I'm I'm just telling you, you, you know, I'm, I'll be 70 years old in November, and I'm a dying man talking to dying people. There's not anybody listening to me that'll be alive 100 years from now. You won't be alive. All of your children will be dead, and most of your grandchildren, if not all of them, will be dead 100 years from now. Think about that. And so. Uh, we, we got this idea that things are just going to go on and on and on. We have an opportunity to be part of a revival here, and I'm hoping that you'll do that. John said that he was our brother and companion in tribulation. Did you ever think about who's your brother? You know, when I was in the Baptist church, uh, when I got in, everybody referred to my brother. Brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, brothers and sisters. <laughs> in fact, it, it, it was a pretty good deal because uh, a lot of times it kept me out of uh, out of trouble when I would see people, they all knew who I was. I'd go in a church and preach a revival, and, and, and I'd see them, oh, come up, hey, Brother Steve, how you doing? And I, I couldn't remember their name from, for anything in the world. I still have a problem in remembering a lot of names. But, but I could always just say, hey, brother, how are you? Hey, sister, good to see you. Got me out of trouble. They didn't know I didn't know your name, but I could call you brother or sister. <laughs> anyway. They're big about doing that in, in, in Christianity, but, but really, who is your brother or your sister? Uh, if you want to talk about being in a relationship with Messiah and in covenant with him, we probably ought to let him tell us who is your brother and who is your sister. There's a passage in, uh, in Matthew chapter 12, and it's the, the same thing is, is, is given to us in Mark chapter 3, verse 31 through 35. But in Matthew chapter 12, uh, beginning verse 46, while he yet, this talks talk about Yeshua, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. And one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak to you. But he, Yeshua, answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who is my brethren? And he, Yeshua, stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother, and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, Yeshua just said that the, his brother, his mother, his sister, is those who shall do the will of his Father in heaven. Does that sound like what I just referred to a while ago in Second Chronicles 7.14 about God's promise to heal our land if we'll turn back and do His will, that is, keep His commandments? Notice He didn't say, for whosoever shall believe in the will of the Father. He said, whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Listen, we have, we, have been, we have been lied to, and the church is, is in the mess that we're in today because we have accepted the mark of the beast, and the mark of the beast is believing the lie that we do not have to obey our Father's commandments anymore. As I said yesterday, the good thing is that you can reject the mark of the beast as long as there's breath within you. You can say, no, I'm coming out of this, uh, and revival would come to us. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. But the, the church is dead and dying today, and yet there's, there's so many people that are so sincere and really want to see God do something, whether it be in the corporate life of the church uh, or in the individual lives. We have seen so many people that are so powerless out there. I think it's interesting that Yeshua gave this right after the, the, the three, 
three verses before, he had talked about the return of the unclean spirit. I think it's significant that he talked here about those being his brothers and sisters or those that do the will of his Father which is in heaven, that is, keeping his Torah. Uh, and remember, the Yeshua said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me, his Father. He didn't come to start something new. He didn't come to give us some new laws or new directions. He came to do the will of him that sent me. He said, my doctrine is not mine, it's, but of him that sent me. So he didn't come with anything new. Yeshua is the living Torah. He is the living Word of God. And, uh, and his righteousness, by the way, uh, is because he walked in Torah. If Yeshua had not kept Torah perfectly, he would have had no righteousness, and you and I could have no righteousness. But our righteousness is in walking as he walked, that is, in Torah. And, oh, if I could get preachers to understand that, uh, there would be some hope for our world. But in, in, in Matthew 12, 43, these verses just prior to this, Yeshua said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he, that is the spirit, saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then, he go, then, then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. I want you to understand what, what Messiah just said right there. That un unless you are doing God's will, unless you're walking in Torah, you can turn over a leaf till you look like a tree, and it ain't going to change anything in your life. That is psycho babble. When, and, and, and the church is doing this when we're appealing to the soulish side of man. And I, I found it interesting when I was uh, first got into church 40 years ago. Tuesday night was soul winning night. We'd go out soul winning. Well, I know the scripture says that he that winneth souls is wise, but every time the word soul is used here in the New Testament, without exception, every time, it is a Greek word suke or psyche, which refers to the mind. And if, if we've skipped... Uh, if we've skipped justification and allowing the Holy Spirit to do that work, which only the Holy Spirit can do, then all we've done is gone out there and used psychology to trick people down the aisle. And I mean, I, I got to tell you, I used to be as good as anybody. Man, I could I could preach a good sermon and and then tell a sad story and then play just the right sad hymn. And and man, I can fill the aisles up. People come down there just weeping and crying. They're wanting to walk in with God. They want to give their life to Jesus. And then I see those same people next year at the next revival come back rededicating their life because they're just so powerless. They, Brother Steve, pray with me because I just can't seem to overcome this. I can't overcome that. And, and what we've done is that we're not giving people the tools that they need to walk in power in the Spirit, and that is to walk in Torah. And it's so frustrating that we see our churches today doing the same thing. I was dealing last, uh, just here a week or so ago, with somebody that a pastor over in East Texas was referring to somebody that was having trouble with uh, alcohol and drugs and, and uh, it was suggesting that uh, maybe he need to go to a place called the Refuge over in Georgia. I'd heard about this place some years ago. I think it's the same place. But over near Atlanta, Georgia, they got a place called the Refuge. It's a place that just specializes in working with pastors and, and uh, church leaders who have have all kind of uh, problems, whether it be alcohol or sex or drugs or whatever. They send them over to this place and they stay sometimes for years where they go through all kind of counseling and therapy to try to help them deal with their addiction, whatever that addiction is. But that's exactly what Yeshua was saying here in Matthew. You can do that kind of stuff all you want to. You can clean that house. You can sweep it. You can have the power of positive thinking all you want to. But all that's going to happen if you do not fill that house with Torah, if you do not fill it with walking in obedience to our Father's commandments, and that's not believing in God, it is believing God. It's believing what He said do. That's why Yeshua said those that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not believing in the will of the Father. If you don't do that, you will find that that, that Spirit's going to come back. Oh yeah, He finds the house swept and clean and garnished. But if you have not filled it with Torah, if you have not filled it with God, with the Holy Spirit leading you to walk in Torah, that Spirit's going to come back with seven worse than himself, and your latter state is going to be worse than the first. And my gosh, we see that all the time. We see people that are 
powerless to overcome their problems and their addictions and, and to put their marriages back together and to, to, to influence their children. And it's because we're using psycho babble. And this is exactly what John was talking about in Revelation, that they would receive the mark of the beast, and that is in the forehead, in your frontal lobe. And you, I'm, I'm telling you, this, I know this sounds simple, friends, but it is just this simple. You either believe God or you believe the devil. You say, oh, well, I ain't going to believe either one. I'm just going to do my own thing. No, you're not. No, you're not. You think you are. But if you're doing your own thing, you're just doing exactly what the devil told you to do. You've made yourself God. That's exactly what he said in Genesis when he told Eve, Oh, no, Eve, you won't die when you eat of that fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. That is, you determine what's right and wrong. No, Eve, silly, silly girl, you won't die. In the day you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God to know good and evil. That is, to decide what's right and wrong for yourself. You don't have to listen to that old gray-haired man over there. <laughs> listen, the devil doesn't have to change his tactic because we're so stupid. We keep falling for it. And the church has done that. When Yeshua told us plainly, he warned us over and over. And Paul and Peter, James, John, all of them warned us. And you say, well, I still, I don't, I don't know, but Steve, I still got kind of problem. You say, we've been in tribulation because... I've been waiting for the mark of the beast, and it's going to be that number 666 on my forehead. Look, the devil's far too smart for that. And the, the, the mark of the beast has been here for 2,000 years. John said that, and John said the spirit of Antichrist. And even now, there are many Antichrists in the world. And... Revelation 13 saying that if any man did not receive the mark, he would not be able to buy or sell. Do you, do you really think that that is something that's going to come uh, uh, in, in the next few years in a period called the Great Tribulation? Now, the Great Tribulation is coming. But we've been, like I say, we've been in tribulation for, for, for uh, 2,000 years. Uh, the last seven years, it's going to be a, a period of great tribulation that Christ said that except those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. That's coming. That's true. Uh, but we've actually uh, been in the tribulation for 2,000 years. And uh, if, you, if you go back and look at Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible commentary and just look at some of the, some of the references uh, about the mark, Jameson Fawcett says the mark or the name uh, in the Greek, the mark uh, of the beast, the mark may be, as in the case of the sealing of the saints in the forehead, remember we've already talked about God was going to seal his saints in the forehead, not a visible mark, but symbolical of allegiance. So the sign of the cross in popery. The Pope's interdict has often shut out the, ex, or, uh, the excommunicate from social and commercial intercourse. This is throughout history. The Pope, if you were excommunicated from the Catholic Church, which you had, that if they caught you observing Sabbath, keeping the dietary laws, or following any of those what they called uh, vile Jewish customs, you were excommunicated from the church. And if you were excommunicated from the church, you could not buy or sell. That's right here. Jameson Fossil. You, you can read this stuff in history. You don't take my word for it. Clark's commentary on the Bible. And that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark. If any observe Bishop Newton, dissent from the stated and authorized forms of Christianity. They are condemned and excommunicated as heretics. And in consequence of that, they are no longer suffered to buy or sell they are interdicted from traffic and commerce and all the benefits of civil society. Do you understand the Roman Catholic Church ruled this way from, from the second century as they began to emerge and the Greek and Roman influence into the church on through the Dark Ages and up into the 1500s? And, and in the 1500s, the Protestants who came out of the Catholic Church were all Catholics. Uh, not only is, is Rome, in Revelation, talked about uh, the woman that sat on seven hills, had a name written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. Yes, she's a whore. She's a false system. That's the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not talking about all Catholics. I've told you before, I've got some, one, one of my dearest friends is a Catholic. Uh, I'm probably going to have him up next month to deer hunt with me at my farm. Uh, he, he's a devout Catholic. He loves Jesus. He's ignorant of the Word. He's totally ignorant of the Word, but he loves Jesus. And uh, it's because the Catholic Church never wanted anybody studying their Bible. 
I can't have an intelligent conversation with a Catholic about what the Bible teaches because, bless their hearts, uh, up until recent years, the, all their masses and everything was done in Latin. The Catholics didn't want them to know what the Bible said. Just do what the church tells you to do. And so this is what's been going on. Uh, and when the, cat, when, the, when the Protestant Reformation came just 500 years ago, uh, we were still under the influence and had been for 1,500 years of the Catholic Church. Look at the canon of the Council of, of, of Laterne under Pope Alexander III. He says, Made against the Waldesines and the Abagesines, enjoins upon pain of anathema that no man presume to in entertain or cherish them in his house or land or exercise traffic with them, that is, do business with them. That is, those that do not follow papal authority. Roger Hovenden relates to William the Conqueror. This is what William the that he was so dutiful to the Pope that he would not permit anyone in his power to buy or sell anything whom he found disobedient to the Apostolic See or to the Pope. The Senate of Tours in France under the same Pope. This is po uh, Pope Alexander III. Under the like inter uh, intermittation that no man should presume to receive or assist them, no, not to so much as hold any communion with them in selling or in buying, that being deprived of the comfort of humanity, they may be compelled to repent of the error of their way. Now, what they were talking about, the error of their way, is that they were walking in obedience to the Father's commandments. They were walking as Yeshua walked. They were keeping the Sabbath. They were observing the dietary laws. They were observing our Father's calendar and keeping the feast days. This has been going on for 2,000 years. Same thing about Pope Martin V that no contract should be made with such and that they should not follow any business and merchandise save he that had the mark, took the oath to be true to the Pope or made a public profession of the Popish religion or the name of the beast, Papist, so-called, from the Pope. Uh, in the 10th and 11th centuries, the severity against the excommunicated was carried to, uh, to so high a pitch that nobody might come near them not even their own wives, children, or servants. They forfeited all their natural legal rights and privileges and were excluded from all kinds of offices. This is the history of the Christian church, of Roman Catholicism. So, yes, the mark of the beast has been here for a long time, as I told you yesterday. There's a reason that most of the Jews, even though they don't acknowledge Christ, they, don't, they, they have been blinded to who the Messiah is. It is the Jews who have held forth the Torah and the God of, of, of the Bible all these years. That's why most of them have their own businesses, they're self-employed, or they work for other Jews because that's the only way they can observe the Father's calendar, observe Shabbat and the dietary laws, and as we are today uh, in, the, in the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a week-long celebration of, uh, of Sukkot. Baptists don't do that. And in fact, I had, a, I had a talk with a friend of mine a long while back. He retired from uh, at the fire department here in Shreveport. And, uh, and, and we were talking about this. And I was trying to get him to understand. I said, just tell me something. What do you think? Uh, Forty years ago, when you went to work for the fire department, you said, look, I, I really want this job. And I've passed my civil service exam. And I really would. I think I'd make a good fireman. But you need to understand, I'll never work on Saturday. Can't ever do that. From Friday night to sundown Saturday, I will not work. And in addition to that, there are seven other high Sabbaths that come at different times during the year that I will not work. And, and I can't tell you, because they change on the, from the Roman calendar, so I can't, I can't tell you right now when they'll be. But, uh, and some of them are week-long celebrations. And I just, I just, you just need to know, I won't work. Nice guys, what do you think would happen to your application for employment? Do you think, that, oh, man, that's great, come on. We've been looking for somebody like you. No. My friends, it has been that if you do not accept the mark of the beast in this system, this world system, for the last 2,000 years, you'd have a hard time making a living. Just try it now. Go to your boss, in fact, uh, go to your boss tomorrow and say, look, I've, I've just realized that uh, I've been wrong. The church is wrong. We've been observing Sunday and uh, so Saturday's a Sabbath. And, and, and because I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk as the Messiah walked, uh, I'm committing myself to him or have committed myself to him, I can no longer work on Saturday. 
you think your boss is going to say, oh, man, I'm so glad to hear that you've, that you've found religion. I'm, I'm just so tickled to hear that you're going to begin to keep the Father's commandments. You think that's what you'd hear? There, there might be a few cases where that would be the case, but I doubt it very seriously, my friend. You see, you have had to accept the mark of the beast for a long period of time if you're going to work in this world. I tell you, uh, this is not new, and I, but it's new. I, I know me telling you this is new. So I've never heard anything like this. I've never heard anybody preach like you're preaching. So I'm just trying to tell you the truth, friend. I'm doing it because I love you. The Apostle Paul, everybody likes to talk to, quote the Apostle Paul and the, the, to think that Paul said that the law had been done away with. But here's a passage that people don't quote a whole lot from Paul these days at least. Found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, wait a minute. What did he say? He said, The unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what is, what is, what is righteousness? If the unrighteous won't, what, what do you have to do to be righteous? Well, you got to just read Deuteronomy 6.25 where God's, and, and by the way, there's, that's just one verse, but it, it's throughout the Scripture, what you call the Old and New Testament, that if you'll be careful to keep his statutes, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments, it shall be righteousness unto you. We read the same thing in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 4 through 6. I have read it many, many times to you that Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, it says that they were both righteous, uh, walking in all of the commandments without blame. <laughs> so they, the Bible, we just, we just don't read the Bible, except pick those verses that we, we want to uh, cherry pick. Uh, but Paul says, No, you're not, the unrighteous not inherit the, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. He said, Don't, 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 don't let somebody deceive you here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua and by the Spirit of our God. My friends, it is, and note that, and by the Spirit of our God, that is the Ruach, Thank God he said, and such were some of you, because I used to be some of that stuff. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, uh, but I, and, and by the way, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. That's a Baptist doctrine that can't be found or substantiated in Scripture either. But, but thank God Paul said, and such were some of you. That is, the fact that you did some of those things doesn't mean there's no hope, but it does mean, my friend, that it's past tense, that you are now walking in Torah. And the reason, you have to understand that the reason the Messiah gave us the Holy Spirit was was to enable us to walk in His grace and in His Torah, because He is the living Torah. But it's going to be rejecting the lie of Satan that the Torah has been done away with. And I'm begging you to come out of it, because this election is not our hope. Our hope is the church will wake up and have the courage to give God the benefit of the doubt and just say, God, our way ain't working, so we're going to try something new. I think we're going to try it the way you said do it for a while and just see how that works. Wouldn't that be a glorious day? So God, we, I think we tried it our way and it didn't work. We're going to try it your way now. I pray that that day comes. Well, I'm out of time. Uh, watch the debate tonight. Pray for God's leadership. Shabbat shalom.